Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Oh my gosh, I missed you so much. Did you miss me? I hope you did. I know you did. I do. Deep down. Not not even that deep. (laughs) Happy 2024. Happy season eight. I am so excited to be here with you. It has been so long since I sat down and I filmed, (sighs) but I am rested, ready to go. The time machine has gone into the shop. She's all tuned up. Uh, All the doohickeys are fixed so that we won't get stuck in, you know, a random time period like Miss Frizzle did. We're not going to be irresponsible. We're very responsible with our time travel. We have lots of fun changes coming up this season. Lots of new things. Lots of fun content. I have a desk. I'm no longer sitting at the dining table anymore. Uh, I used to drag the dining room table into here to record. But now I have a desk. And it's very exciting. And I have a new camera that I'm still not quite sure how to use yet. Uh, But it's... We're... We're doing it one step at a time. There's new lighting. There's so many new things going on. And it's all because of you and these wonderful human beings known as the Vlog Brothers, aka John and Hank Green. If you have spent any amount of time on the edutainment side of YouTube and the internet as a whole, you have probably heard their names before. And these two wonderful human beings run a grant program for small educational content creators. And you might have seen on Instagram already, but I applied for the grant and I found out a few weeks before the end of the year that um, my application was accepted. And because of them, I was able to really up the quality of For the Love of History and I'm just grateful to them as well as the many new Patreon members that we have gotten last year and this year and I'm just so grateful that people are are rooting for For the Love of History and they find value in it and they want to support it and it just makes me really happy. But I promise I won't cry. It's the first episode of the season. Let's get, hold it together, TK. I swear I'm like the single most emotional history podcaster on the internet. But that is, that is a title I will wear with pride. I'm totally fine with that. So I just want to say a big thank you to the Vlog Brothers, Hank and John Green, as well as the wonderful Patreon members, both new and OGs. So with that emotion out of the way let's get into some other emotions love but also betrayal and a real life corpse bride we are talking about the story of pedro and inez and by the end of this episode you'll be saying romeo and juliet who so without further ado let's grab a box of tissues because you might cry i might cry maybe (laughs) and your favorite chocolate treat hop into the time machine And let's get to it. Now, I do not believe that we have ever done a Portuguese history episode before. It's it's a first for the pod, and boy, what a first it is. Today, we'll be diving into the story of King Pedro and Inez, which sounds like a the title of a really great romance story and it kind of is but this romance story is a little bit different a little bit dark and we're not talking like corpse bride tim burton kind of dark we're talking m night Shyamalan kind of dark here so let us start this story where most stories end a happy ever after and a wedding the wedding in question was that of 20 year old prince pedro the first of portugal and 22-year-old Constanza Manuel, a Castilian noblewoman. In 1340, love matches among the nobility were rare, and these youngins were no different. Brought together for alliance purposes by their dads and a gaggle of advisors, Pedro and Constanza were set to be your typical royal couple. Pop out a few kids, hope one of them is a boy, and hope that boy lives long enough to secure a peaceful transfer of power. But fate... Fate had other plans. For among Constanza's ladies-in-waiting, there was a young Inez de Castro. And just a little side note here about her age. It's 
ambiguous. And just a little side note here, Inez's exact age is ambiguous. Some sources say that she was born in 1325, others say 1323, and for Pedro's sake, I want to believe that she was 17 when they met and not 15. And the database Britannica says that she was born in 1323, so I'm gonna go with that for my own sanity, my own peace of mind, but I digress. According to Legend and also a very cheesy 2005 TV series, it was love at first sight. Pedro only had eyes for Inez, which would have been fine. Mistresses are no big deal in the royal world, but infatuation and obsession, that was not fine. Pedro was completely taken with Inez to the point of almost ignoring Constanza, which was the problem. The more time Pedro spent with Inez doing horizontal activities, the less time he had with Constanza making little heirs to the throne. But the two could not be stopped. At first, their love affair was kept on the DL, with Pedro doing everything he could to speak with Inez without arising, arousing? That's the word, arousing suspicion, going as far as sending her letters through drainage systems. But eventually, the two were found out. As he, always. If you're cheating, you're going you're gonna to get found out. Life lessons with TK. Anyways, Constanza, being no dummy, set to task breaking them up. Constanza, though her part in this story is brief, make no mistake that she was no dummy or a bystander in her own story. Nay, nay, dear one. She was a smart little biscuito, which I think is how you pronounce the name of a Portuguese cookie. What I'm, I'm trying to say, she was a smart cookie. But yeah, anyways. <laughs> For the birth of their son, Constanza came up with the bright idea to make Inez the baby's godmother. And, and I hear you asking TK, what would, what would that do? How could that stop Inez and Pedro? And to that, dear one, I say, uh, that's a question for the Catholic Church. <laughs> because during this time, in the eyes of the Catholic Church, once someone became a godparent, they literally became blood-related. So if Inez was the godmother of Pedro and Constanza's baby, that would make Pedro and Inez blood relatives. And therefore, their affair would become incestuous and illegal. To have an affair with your wife's mistress was one thing, but having an affair with your child's godmother was icky and completely out of the question. This really put Inez in a hard place. She could either say no and piss off the king and the royal court and cause all sorts of public shame for herself by saying no to being the godmother of the future king of Portugal, or she could say yes and make her affair with Pedro incestuous and illegal. But she chose the former. She said no. She refused the position of godmother, and we have no records of how she was feeling at this time or if she was coerced or persuaded. We don't know. We have no idea how she was feeling, but I'm sure it could not have been easy for her because her actions angered Pedro's father, King Afonso IV, so much that he had Inez banished from the palace in 1344. But this didn't stop Pedro and Inez and their affair didn't end. They kept at it. And for Constanza, this was the least of her worries because it was her job to produce heirs to the Portuguese throne. And unfortunately for her, having children did not really come easy. In 1344, she lost the first heir, Louise, that Inez was going to be the godmother of because he only lived for eight days. Less than a year later, she was pregnant again and had her third child. She had a previous child from another marriage, but that's a whole nother story that we're not gonna get into right now. This baby would turn out to be the heir that she needed the little future king Ferdinand but that little Ferdinand came at a cost Constanza would pass away in childbirth at least that's what we thought happened until 2010 when the historian Frederico Francisco Stuart de Figaniere e Morao nice good job me <laughs> wrote in his book Memorias das Reinas de Portugal 
Thank you, pronunciation.com. Anyways, <laughs> he says in his book that based on an obituary from the Church of San Bartolomeo, Bart, oh, geez, why did I put all the hard words to say in one sentence? In an obituary from the Church of San Bartolomeo, Constanza died from postpartum complications in 1349 and not. 1345. This is also backed up by other historians, including Anne Rodriguez Oliveira, who says that the most likely date of Constanza's death is January 27th, 1349, which means that Pedro and Inez went public with their affair before the death of Pedro's lawful wife. After the death, air quotes, of his wife in 1345, Pedro decided to pick up and move in with Inez, who had been banished to Coimba, Coimbra, Coimbra, yes, where they stayed playing house and having babies. And this royally pissed off the king. He and his wife had tried over and over again to persuade Pedro to marry one of the many fine ladies of the royal court, but Pedro, once again, only had eyes for Inez. But why did the king hate Inez so much? Well, there are three reasons for this. Firstly, she had some brothers. They were Catalan, Catalan, Catalan? Catalan sympathizers, and Spain really wanted to get its hands on independent Portugal. Inez's brothers and Pedro became super bros, which gave Catalonia a little bit too much access to the future king of Portugal, which was very problematic for King Alfonso because he wanted to keep Portugal free and not under Spain's rule which is understandable. The second reason the king did not like Inez was because of all the baby making Inez and Pedro were doing. This was really screwing up the line of succession. So Ferdinand was supposed to be the heir, right? But he was pretty sickly and Inez and Pedro's kids were healthy and strong. So if Ferdinand, the only legitimate heir, died, the only heirs that were left would be illegitimate from Inez, whom the king despised. And the third and I think most important reason the king did not like Inez was because she was of dubious lineage. Her parents, although both of them nobles, were not married when she was conceived and born, which was totally her fault, right? How dare she? How dare she not come forth from her parents' loins as like a little baby ghost and be like, please get married before I'm born. It's totally a thing that's her fault and not her parents' fault at all. A reasonable thing to be upset about, King Afonso's heavy on the sarcasm. <laughs> So because she was not of noble stock, she was not fit to be the next queen of Portugal. And that was enough to make the king never allow them to be married. But to that, Pedro said, GTFO, Dad, I love her. So you can suck it and proceeded to live with Inez and have four children with her. They lived and loved for almost 10 years. And each year that passed, Afonso's grew more and more angry and resentful towards Inez. He thought eventually Pedro would grow tired of her, but he never did. Their love seemed to get stronger as the years passed. And so Afonso's decided to take matters into his own hands and ordered Inez's death. Upon hearing this, Inez took herself and her children back to the palace and pled with the king to spare her life. She had two of her children with her and she begged at the feet of the king to spare her and accept her children. But this motherfucker got up and left the room and allegedly told his advisors, do whatever you want. Do whatever you want, you cold-hearted waste of space. 
looking into the eyes of your grandchildren. I can't even speak. Looking into the eyes of your grandchildren and into the eyes of the woman that your son loves. I get it. She's not of noble stock. But how? How could you do that? And just be like, whatever. Do whatever you want. I, I could care less. Cold. Heartless. Congratulations. First garbage human of the season. Not an award that you want. But... I digress. Shortly after this, the king hired three assassins. And when Pedro was away from home, which why would you leave your spouse when your dad is threatening to kill them? I I don't know, but it's so dumb. He left for whatever reason and the three assassins surprised Inez and killed her. And some sources say that they stabbed her to death and one other says that they beheaded her, but however it was done, it was done in front of her children at Quinta das Lagrimas. And according to legend, the residence at Quinta das Lagrimas is where they killed her, and from her tears appears a fountain. Fonte das Lagrimas, or the Fountain of Tears. And to this day, you can apparently see the stone where her blood was spilled, and it's still red. Hundreds and hundreds of years later. When Pedro returned, he found his slain wife and weeping children and went into an absolute rage, which is one billion gazillion trillion percent understandable like a fair aside for a sec your dad kills the love of your life in front of your kids how how many generations of of trauma does that create i i have no words JK, yes, I do. I have many words. To borrow a saying from my dad, I'm going to need Afonso's to take a long walk off of a short pier with lead shoes on because that's how much I dislike this man. Pedro understandably flipped out and basically almost started a civil war in Portugal because he went to war against his dad and brought a whole bunch of guys with him that were on his side. And then his dad brought a bunch of guys with him that were on his side, but they were all Portuguese. Essentially, civil war. And after a few months of escalation and a lot of deaths and no end in sight, Pedro's mom, Queen Beatrice, was like, you two, you need to stop right now. Pedro, you go sit in your corner. Afonsos, you go sit in your corner and think about what you've done. Are, like, are you guys really going to tear the country apart? Because of this situation, I know you're upset. I know what you did was wrong. But listen, you need to get your shit together. You're a leader. You're a future leader of a whole freaking country. So calm down. Be nice. And she effectively saved Portugal from civil war. So go Beatrice. In the end, Pedro agreed and the fighting stopped. And he played nice with his dad. But never forgot. And never forgave. And two years later, in 1357, Alfonso's passed away, making Pedro the king. And this is where things get little bananas. Love can make you do crazy things, but grief, grief, dear one, can make you do unhinged things things. Almost immediately after his father's death, the old flame of vengeance was sparked once more and Pedro was ready to avenge his Inez. A lot of important details in history get lost and who killed who and what people's real names were is among that information. But in this situation, we have the full ass government names of all three of the people who mercilessly killed Inez. We have Pedro Coelho, Alvaro Goncalves, and Diogo Lopez Pacheco. I'm not going to be too serious about their names because they were murderers. Anyways, Pedro was bent on revenge and invited the assassins to a dinner party. A dinner party. Diego had allegedly fled the country, so he didn't come, but the other two did. And Sobek only knows what possessed the other two to stay and actually attend the dinner but they did they did and what they found there was the opposite of a warm welcome 
almost immediately the two were tied up and presented to now King Pedro, who in front of all of his guests and those that were gathered, disemboweled the assassins and scooped out their hearts with his bare hands, saying anyone who could kill an innocent woman like Inez in cold blood surely had no hearts, and he made sure that they did not have hearts. I just scooping him out. Whoa. Ugh. 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 That gives me the heebie jeebies. Like I know they were assassins. But that is that that is a shade too far, Pedro. A shade too far. But I get it. Love, passion, unhinged act activities, whatever, that's fine, sure. Uh, but, but this incident earned him the name Pedro the Cruel, and, and this was just the beginning of his downward spiral into madness. Pedro's father had not allowed him to marry Inez, but he insisted that they were secretly wed, and therefore Inez was the rightful queen of Portugal. But Pedro didn't just proclaim his dear one to be the queen nay nay <laughs> nay nay my delicious little donut according to legend uh and a few historical accounts after the fact he had inez exhumed cleaned dressed with a royal diadem and official queen clothes and everything and held a coronation a coronation for her making her the first and only posthumously appointed queen of portugal she was propped up in a throne next to pedro and the royal court was made to come kiss the hem of her skirt and or her decaying hand what what okay Ugh gross okay yeah so they had to do that they kiss in the hem of her dress or and or her decaying hand swearing loyalty to to the corpse queen uh and this scene has been painted by many artists like pierre charles comte and it's been written about it many times but we don't actually know if this really happened there's no hard evidence but given the fact that people have done more outrageous things in history it wouldn't surprise me in the least if this was real but it is really really gross to think about <laughs> so whether Inez had a corpse coronation or not her body was in fact exhumed and brought to the royal monastery at Alcobaca Basa Baca Anyways, so she could be close to Pedro. And in his final act of love, he had two matching sarcophagi made for him and Inez. And let me tell you, friend, these things are an adhd -er in the midst of hyperfixation level of detail. From top to bottom, these sarcophagi are covered in the story of their love and chock full of symbolism. If we were to cover every detail of both of these sarcophagi, it would take a whole other episode. So I'll just give you the highlights. The tombs were constructed between 1358 and 1367. We don't know the exact time and we also don't know who created these tombs. Many believe he was Portuguese but had some French influences. On the top of both sarcophagi are statues of six angels. They look like they're fussing over the dead to make them as comfortable as possible and even raising their heads a little bit higher as if to make them sleep more comfortably. Tomb is supported by six hybrid looking beings on Inez's tomb and then six lions on Pedro's tomb. They have, the hybrid looking things are a little bit weird. They've got like human faces, but like animal bodies. It's, it's a little creepy. <laughs> but that's, everything else is really nice. There's a lot of symbolism in the other statues and carvings. On, on one side of Inez's sarcophagus, there are scenes of Jesus's life that depict his final judgment, which some historians suspect was included because King Pedro wanted to show that he and Inez had a place in heaven, unlike the people who did them wrong, aka his father and the murderers. On Inez's sarcophagus, also, there are many other religious symbols, queenly symbols, and an inscription description saying queen of portugal it's beautiful and godly and all that jazz but what makes my heart go 
<laughs> and like melt a little bit uh, are the carvings on Pedro's sarcophagus. On the head side of his tomb, there are three concentric circles. The biggest one is called the Wheel of Life, and it has 12 sections that show scenes from Pedro and Inez's life together. It has a scene of Inez cuddling her children. It has a scene of the couple and their kids. It has a scene of Inez and Pedro playing chess together. The couple just like spending time together. Pedro seated on a throne. It also has Inez's assassination. It has Inez lying dead. It has the punishment of Inez's killers and then King Pedro wrapped in a shroud symbolizing his death when Inez died. In the second concentric circle called the Wheel of Fortune there are six sections that symbolize the purity of love between the two and the immortality and resurrection they will eventually achieve in heaven when they are finally able to be together. When Pedro died, he ordered the two sarcophagi to be placed side by side for all eternity, and they stayed that way until the 20th century when they were moved into the tomb room of Alcobasa Monastery, but eventually they moved back to the southern part of the church where they rest to this day facing each other, finally able to be together in peace. Well, dear one, we have come to our final thought and boy, do I have a recommendation for you. Okay, so I need you to get so close right now and listen very carefully. I did not know that I needed a time-traveling reincarnation historical fiction love story. But let me tell you about the one that I found when researching this episode. So the, the movie in question is called The Dead Queen, all right? And it's about the love story of Inez and Pedro, but not only that. So these two souls, these two lovers, try to find each other in multiple lifetimes, in multiple eras, but also Constanza is there as well. So it's like Pedro and Inez and Constanza and the father are all in different time periods and I'm not gonna spoil the end for you but it is very good it is very good I love it so much and I think you should watch it I think you really should watch it because I think you'll like it I think you might cry a little bit because I definitely cried a little bit so that's your homework <laughs> Well, dear one, that is all she wrote. We have finished the first episode of season eight. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed researching it and bringing it to you. And I'd like to say a very, very special thank you to Rita, a history BFF. Uh, she is one of the OGs and I just thank her so much for telling me about this historical story and uh, yeah, thank you so much Rita for, for sharing this with me so that I could share it with other history BFFs. I really appreciate you. I'm so incredibly excited to be back and bringing you world history, women's history, and weird history every single week for the next like 13 weeks. If you did enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rating or review or letting me know what you thought about this episode in particular using Spotify's new episode question and answer feature. You can also support the podcast by sending this episode or any other to someone who you think needs to be converted into a history BFF. Applications are always open. And you may have noticed uh, in this episode, if you're listening on Apple or Spotify or, or another platform, that there are ads now. Uh, we have We've joined a network, which is very, very exciting. Um, I I never thought that we would get here, but we're here, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. And if you'd like to listen to the episode without there's any advertisements on it, you can join us over for $2 a month on Patreon for ad-free and early access listening and all sorts of other fun Patreon bonus goodie stuff. And if you would like to match me, if you want to be twinsies, uh, you can head on over to the merch store and see if there's anything that you would like to pick up for yourself for some official For the Love of History uniform. I don't know. <laughs> merch. I've said merch like 5,000 times. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but if that's not a possibility for you, that's totally okay. There's so many free 99 ways to support For the Love of History by liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing over on the YouTube channel. Chanel. 
but also just being here and listening and joining me each week is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for being you. And with that, I will tell you to go outside if you haven't yet, touch some grass, do something that makes you happy, drink your water, and I will see you next week when we talk about a sexy Chinese war goddess. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, if I don't see you, until then, happy Valentine's Day. I love you so much. Okay, bye. Why is there a metronome right now? Okay. <laughs>